Good afternoon. Welcome to our lecture program. I am Kostas Janos, Vice President and Chair of the Program Committee of Hellenic Link Midwest. First, I would like to announce our next lecture that will be held on Sunday, November 13, at 3 p.m. Chicago time. We will present Professor Alexander Kiru in a talk titled The Real Ohi Day, Freeing the Greco Italian War of 1940 1941 from myth and misunderstanding. This lecture will discuss the significance and major consequences of the Greco Italian War of 1940 41 for the wider World War II. Our speaker this afternoon is Professor Yorgos Anagnostou. His lecture is supported by the Hellenic Foundation Chicago, and we greatly appreciate the support of the foundation. Professor Anagnostou is the Miltiades Marinakis Professor of Modern Greek Language and Culture at the Ohio State University. His interests include diaspora and American ethnic studies with a focus on Greek America. His published research covers a broad range of subjects, including film, documentary, ethnography, folklore, literature, history, sociology, and public humanities. He is the author of Condors of White Ethnicity, Popular Ethnography and the Making of Use of Pasts in Greek America. He is co-editor of Redirecting Ethnic Singularity, Italian Americans and Greek Americans in Conversation. Since 2017, he is the editor of the online journal Ergon, Greek American Arts and Letters. The lecture is going to be closed with a questions and answers session. You can type your question at any time by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. This will open another screen where you can type your question. Those attending the event on Facebook can type their questions on the comments box on the left or at the bottom of the screen. Professor Anagnostou, the screen is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it is a joy. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you for opening um, channels of communication, really building bridges uh, between the university and the broader community. So I'm delighted then to share my thoughts about our topic. I have prepared a PowerPoint, uh, which I will be downloading um, right now. Uh, and here we go. And, and here it is. Uh, we will be traveling to the 100 years earlier uh, in the 1900s until the 1920s. Uh, I would like to start, though, uh, with a particular publication in 1997. And this publication was published in um, the Greek America in a journal. It was a two-page uh, essay written from the perspective of Achepa on the occasion of the 75 years of the foundation of this organization. And as you see on the screen, uh, here we have a case where the author, James Schofield, who was a leader of the Achepa at the time, speaks about the um, racism that Greek uh, immigrants uh, experienced is a forgotten history in the 1990s. Uh, the impact of the Klan on um, the Americans of Hellenic heritage uh, has not been somehow, is not remembered. Uh, so here then, uh, and he speaks about the necessity of us remembering and he speaks about, um, again, he, he claims that Greek Americans do not know how deeply the evil shadows of bigotry, hatred, and intolerance cast a malignant darkness over North America. Perhaps it is time to remember them. And I think uh, the question here, of course, is raised, okay, what good does it do uh, to remember this kind of um, 
uh, history. Uh, it is very interesting, of course, if we look at um, mainstream histories of Greek Americans, uh, the authoritative history, one of the first ones, uh, by an academic Theodore Salutos in 1964, the uh, history of the Order of Achepa by George Leber in 1972, and Charles Moskos in the 1980 and beyond. All these histories do include discussion about the, the clan, the anti-Greek riots that we will be talking about. So it is very interesting then that the mainstream Greek American history does in many ways register these events. But again, the question is raised, uh, why is there forgetting, right? A broader forgetting about this era. So why this forgetting? What good does it do to remember? Uh, what, do, does it, what do we do with this kind of um, knowledge? So our story will take us to uh, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, when the United States is industrialized rapidly. So here then we have the context of industrial revolution. And um, the country in many ways is in need. There is a demand for, in, for labor. And it is Southeastern Europe that is the place where now a new wave, a mass wave of immigrants, uh, 50 years after the German immigrants and the Irish immigrants um, reached these shores. Now we have uh, about 20 million immigrants from Southeastern Europe arriving to the United States. This is a staggering number. Uh, so we have about in, within the span of 30 years, a vast number of people, four, four, uh, 4 million Italians, 2 million Southeastern uh, European Jewish people, and 500,000 Greek Orthodox uh, from the Greek kingdom, but also we have Greek Orthodox people from um, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the major drive for immigration then, particularly when it comes to the Greek kingdom, is economic. What um, he, uh, sociologists speak about the push and pull uh, factor. Uh, the pull factor is the conditions in the United States, there are plenty of jobs. The push factor is about the Greek realities at the time when we have high poverty in um, rural Greece uh, for a number of reasons. We have high taxation and then farmers um, are finding immigration as a route for socioeconomic mobility. And again, the, the, uh, the early approach to immigration was uh, that it will be temporary. It was a male immigration almost exclusively. And the idea was we will be uh, immigrating for about five years, we'll be making some money, and then we'll be coming back to the village to invest our money and um, develop our fields. So it is very interesting then where where, in what kind of economic niches did these immigrants find jobs? It again is connected with industrialization. Um, uh, there is an economic growth in the United States, there's consumerism, and there's a need for services. So in the, there's a textile industry, there is the shoe shine industries, there is railroad construction, there is mining, and there are street vendors and confectionaries and food services. So these are then the primary occupations, the occupational niches, so to speak, where the incoming immigrants are finding jobs. Uh, for for the, the newcomers, America was a promise. And uh, what is interesting, because the industry needed labor and needed inexpensive uh, labor, in many ways, they would send the corporations they were very active in the recruitment of immigrants. Uh, labor agents will uh, travel across the, the Greek countryside and they will spread these rumors that it is easy to make money in, um, in the United States. You come and you work and then in one or two years, you will be wealthy. And the, uh, the author Mary Vardulakis has dramatized this story, Gold in the Streets. So the United States appears then as, as a promise. And here I have a, a photograph of the mountainous Peloponnese. And the first immigrants um, mostly uh, were originated in the Peloponnese. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, a, 
section of the immigrants uh, came from the um, Ottoman Empire, and there their motives and their motivations were, were different. When in 1908, we have the new Turkish revolution and the Greek Orthodox subjects at the time um, are required to uh, conscribe to the um, Ottoman army, then we have the first waves of um, the Greeks from the Ottoman Empire um, heading towards um, the United uh, States. We do have some letters that somehow register the first impression of immigrants. And the first letter that we have found is written in 1908 uh, by uh, a, 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 a recent immigrant who joined his uncle. And here we see uh, what immigration historicals call chain immigration. Uh, the families in Greece strategize. So they will send one male um, first in the United States to see how is the situation, will they be able to make it? And if this person made it, then the, he will be inviting another brothers or uncles or um, fathers. Uh, if you have watched the, the film America, America by Leah Kazan, this is what this um, uh, family from Anatolia did. They sent their eldest uh, son first. Uh, so the, 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 in many ways, the, the, uh, the farmers uh, knew the proverb, the fruta uh, so kalathi. So you will not put all the fruits in the same basket, right? So it was a, an interesting, very cautious strategy uh, for uh, thinking about the bettering of the family. And here we have then an individual who is writing his first letter to his uh, uh, brothers and father and parents. And he joins his uncle who has found work in the family of the Economopoli, but who, who had abbreviated their name to Economopolis. And these, there, there were two brothers. They had in New Jersey and in Long Island, actually. They had a, a, a confectioner, they had a hotel, they had a, 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 a bathhouse. So here then we have the newcomer encountering this leisure time in the United States and feeling that, oh, this is a paradise. And indeed, uh, he concludes his letter by saying, e Ameriki in o epigios paradisus, America is a heaven on earth. Uh, we do have, though, uh, contrasting impressions. In, in, in the 1990s, um, I came across, I found this diary that was written in the 1930s by an immigrant. Uh, uh, his name was Gus Marcos, and he came to the United States actually in 1902 in Chicago, uh, which was a hub back then. And then he will try to find jobs whenever uh, jobs were available, uh, mostly in railroad construction. So they will get word that there is uh, job availability in um, Kansas or in Colorado. So they, they, will, they will take the train and they will uh, be a kind of itinerant migrant workers. And it is extraordinary if you read this, um, this diary, the diary is a litany. By the way, I translated this um, uh, uh, originally in Greek a diary with my uh, colleague and friend, uh, friend uh, Gerasimus Katzen. And what is interesting here, we see a litany of facts. This immigrant is recorded. He does not record his impressions about the landscape. He does not record his impressions about the customs and the culture of the country, which he now starts uh, exploring, he's very much preoccupied with listing the expenses and the travels that he has to do in order to find a job, how much money he made, how much money he spent. And at some point in the diary, he erupts um, in, a kind, in, a, in a very deep resentment. And I am sharing here a translation of this passage. So he's, he writes then, with these wages I was receiving, I had to buy clothes for myself as well as pay my rent. You can imagine how much money I had left over. Enough to even feed the stray dogs as a proverb, as a proverb has it. People say, go to America to make money, can dig it out of the earth or can find it spilled in the streets so you can pick it up, one or another. 
not only will they fail in America, but will come back empty handed. Uh, and this is the experience of many uh, early immigrants who were working mostly in the Colorado, in Utah, in New Mexico, uh, in railroad construction and in mines, as we will see. And I found a quote here that I, uh, I thought it would be interesting to share with you. So speaking about then the American dream, the promise of America, the ideals and realities. And this is a quote not from a Greek immigrant, but I think it applies to Greek immigrants as well. Uh, it is the realization that uh, you know the, uh, uh, the United States is not the El Dorado that uh, it was promised. So I came to America because I heard the streets were paved with gold. Right? We see again the theme of um, the golden opportunity. When I got here, I found out three things. First, the streets were not paved by gold. Second, they weren't paved at all. And third, I was expected to pave them. Right? The realities. Let us try to imagine uh, the social and the political environment um, in the early 1920s. That was an era with momentous, uh, dramatic historical events. Uh, there were both in relation to Greece, but also in relation to the United States, uh, the Balkan Wars, uh, the two Balkan Wars, 1912 and 1913 the national schism in Greece that really divided the Greeks and also divided Greek immigrant communities, as you will know, in the United States. We do have the uh, revival of the Ku Klux Klan. We have the First World War. We have very strong assimilationist and nativist um, movements. And we have immigration restrictions. So the immigrants then have to, are exposed to all these events and they are responding in different ways. So what we see, these events uh, are creating an environment where the identities of the immigrants start shifting. We do have the emergence of bicultural identities. For the working class, we do have a participation in the labor movement where they are, they start developing a, a working class Greek American identity. We have the middle class, the small shopkeepers, who as we will see embrace 100% assimilationism for a number of reasons. We have displays of loyalty to Greece, but also eventually uh, a loyalty to both countries, Greece and the United States, before there is a dramatic shift towards ex uh, exclusively an exclusive political loyalty towards the new home, the United States. So here then we have Greek America uh, being a heterogeneous and, and kind of hosting all kinds of identities, a very interesting and challenging situation for historians to figure out. So we have Greek American identities, we have Greek identities, we have Americanized Hellenic identities, we have Greek Orthodox, Greek American identities, but also we have Greek American non-Greek Orthodox identities as well. Uh, the, the overriding question that really preoccupied the United States at that time was whether the new immigrants, as they were called, they were called new immigrants in counter distinction from the earlier waves of the German immigrants and the Irish immigrants. So were the new immigrants a positive addition to the country or were they a dire threat, right? Remember, we have 20 million people coming to the United States. They don't speak the language. They look different than the Western Europeans. They are dressed differently. Their customs are uh, strange. So this then creates a deep anxiety whether these um, uh, uh, populations will be contributing to the community or will there be a cultural and as we will see a biological threat. Uh, and I will be following now the language that newspapers and academics and uh, journalists used at that time. So let us keep in mind then that the new immigrants were discussed in terms of race. Uh, 
But now we speak about Greek Americans as an ethnicity or Irish Americans or Italian Americans. Back then the Irish and the Greeks and the Italians were seen as distinct races. And they were ranked hierarchically within the existing, existing hierarchical system within the United States. As we will see, they were classified often as inferior and as not fitting both biologically and culturally in America, and therefore they posed a grave threat. Uh, one of the first uh, authoritative accounts about early Greek immigrants is from the anthrop anthropologist Henry Pratt Fairchild, 1911. He was teaching at Yale, and what he did, he, he tried to understand the Greek immigrants, who were they, were they assimilatable? And he traveled to Greece. That was one of the first anthropologists, American anthropologists, to travel to Greece to understand uh, where do these people come from? What are their habits, right? Uh, what brings them to America? So we have here a very um, uh, uh, rich volume, uh, but at the same time, a volume that um, ultimately uh, does not have a very sympathetic view of the immigrants. And I will be quoting from his book. He says, there is much similarity between the case of the N-word, the black people, and that of the, mo of, mo of the modern immigrants. To be sure, the newcomers are for the most part white skinned instead of colored. Yet in the mind of the average American, the modern immigrants are generally regarded as inferior people. Races he looks down on and with which he does not wish to associate in terms of social equality. So it is very interesting then that at the time the racial classification was not based on the color of the skin of the of the skin, right? But it was based on all kinds of other cultural and biological attributes: the height of the body, the shape of the nose, uh, the traditions and the habits of these people. So it was a kind of a different system that we are used, or not a kind, was radically different system than what, than what we use today when we are speaking about the Euro European Americans. Uh, another, another example of this kind of hierarchical classification, uh, this is from the San Francisco Chronicle and I quote, the descendants of the undesirable Greeks may become loyal and useful American citizens. Unlike the Asiatics, Greek immigrants do not differ from us so radically in all essential particulars, as they can never assimilate, but must always remain a race apart. So, uh, we have then, uh, in, in, regarding the question, are they capable of assimilation? And this is a perennial question of who can become American, who qualifies to become American, and what are the criteria for belonging to the American nation? So I can, uh, I, we can identify three broad approaches, uh, three narratives. Uh, the first one is um, the staunch nativist and racist approaches, and that was extremely popular at the time, where the new immigrants were seen as bi in a biological and economic threat to the nation. They should either be kicked out, that was the language, as we will see, or later the, the, the races would say, well, as they saw that the immigrants were keen to stay, or a percentage of the immigrants were keen to stay, they imposed 100% assimilation. The second route was they must assimilate. Uh, there is no room here for hyphenated identities. Greek Americans is not a desirable identity from the perspective of the 100% um, aggressive assimilationists. And we have the third then um, approach, which is uh, which maintained that the immigrants are a positive addition. Uh, they need though aid to integrate and we must help them gradually assimilate into the country. And starting with the third then approach, this will bring us to Chicago and most probably you are aware of the um, Hull House and Jane Addams, right? And these were the social progressives that embraced this gradual benign assimilation. They tried to understand the immigrants. They tried to 
identify what their problems were so that they will be helping them to find their way into American, the American society. And they will employ sociologists who would visit uh, the immigrant homes. They will interview the people. They will examine their, uh, their um, approaches to hygiene, what they are eating, are they teaching English to their children? So they will try then to create sociological profiles of the immigrants. And here then we have um, one of the first articles written about the Greek immigrants in Chicago, uh, published in the American Journal of Sociology in 1909 uh, by Grace Abbott, who at the time was a director of the League for the Protection of Immigrants. So he expresses for the most part sympathetic views about the immigrants. Uh, he says that considered from other standpoints, the Greek is a most desirable immigrant. Uh, the context here is that yes, he, he admits that some um, immigrants break uh, city ordinances, but he says, well, they do that not because they are criminals, but because they don't know the, the laws. So we must then teach them the laws. And by the way, there were so many infractions of um, uh, city ordinances that the nativists and the racists will then use them as evidence that these people are criminally oriented. Uh, also, another quote um, uh, from um, Grace Abbott, industrially, the Greek is a positive asset in the United States. So since the 1909, we have a particular movement uh, and a particular expression in Chicago that is opening the path for the immigrants to find their ways to American um, culture. This is very different. This is drastically different than the nativist and racist approach. And the movement here, the movement, the nativist movement is steadfast, steadfastly wants the immigrants out early on. He sees them as a cultural and um, economic threat, uh, immigrants out. And we see here the sign in regards to um, the Japanese immigrants. And nativism, right, is, a, an anti-Catholic and anti-radical uh, movement that uh, uh, believes in the cult of Anglo-Saxon superiority. And its major political pro uh, project was, and perhaps still is, has been about the restriction of immigration. And in many ways, the, uh, the uh, nativists, for reasons that we will, I will explain, they were successful in really closing the door uh, from Europe, reducing it, not entirely, but reducing the immigration from Europe, including Greece, to um, a trickle. Uh, so we have then the laws around the 1921. And then we see here that Achepa, right, is founded in 1922 around this uh, very uh, uh, critical um, moment in American history. And of course, they, the native is also there. Uh, uh, they were very successful in um, uh, passing the Chinese Exclusion Act and also that uh, the fact that Asian Americans were excluded from naturalization until the 1940s, unlike the European, Southeastern European immigrants who had the right to citizenship uh, much earlier. Uh, the, the presence of massive waves of immigration gave the opportunity for the clan to revive itself. Um, we have the numbers. It, the, the membership was peaked in the 1920s. About 4 million Americans um, were members and the profits were really trickling in membership, the selling of um, regalia, costumes, publications. Here then we have an economic powerful organization that is parading um, in small town America. This is the, an example from Indiana, but also in the nation's capital. And, many, uh, and in many occasions, the Klan feels that they can parade without hiding their faces. In other words, there is a legitimation they, there is a wide, broad acceptance of their movement. Um, and if, if I can share this story, I, once in the 1990s, I interviewed a Greek American who grew up in um, American born, who grew up in um, rural Ohio. And he was telling me that 
his father, the, the clan was marching in a small town, Ohio, and they were hiding their faces. Uh, that was a small place. And his father identified a particular clansman as his neighbor. How? From his shoes. He recognized the shoes. And he said he was heartbroken. So you didn't know who your neighbor was at the time. And again, the massive movement of the clan, of course, was and their presence, their very public presence in small towns, rural communities could not escape the immigrants. And we will see how we have a very few direct testimonies of how individuals felt by having the immediate presence, the threat of um, the clan in their um, neighbors. Uh, going back to the article by Schofield, and just to illustrate the tremendous political power of the clan at the time, it elected 16 US senators, 11 governors, large number of congressmen. It ruled local politics. And in 1924, a clan candidate won the gubernatorial contest in five of six states, barely losing in Texas. And this political power helps us explain why the, the Klan was effective in shaping immigration restriction, right? In 1921 and 1924, the Klan closed the door um, to the, uh, uh, immigrants from Southeastern Europe and other, of course, um, continents. Uh, I just felt like sharing this uh, clan song that has a reference to the Greeks. Again, the, the clan symbol it was the burning cross, and they would burn the cross uh, in hills facing immigrant communities to intimidate the Catholics. The Catholics got an anathema for the clan, and sometimes they confuse the Greek Orthodox with the Catholics. They would think that they are the same denomination. And here we see their parade in a small town, and here we see their faces are covered. So here then we have cards uh, which declared, I quote, when cotton grows on the fig tree and alfalfa hangs on the rose, when the aliens run the United States and the Jews grow a straight nose, when the Pope is praised by everyone in the land of Uncle Sam and the Greek is elected president then, the Ku Klux Klan won't be worth a damn. Just one more example to illustrate the depth of the nativist ideas, how they percolated into the very popular fabric of American society. And here we have a professor of Harvard University publishing in the National Geographic, a popular magazine, giving credence, giving validity to the pseudo-scientific um, idea of eugenics. Uh, eugenics was a principle that was used in animal science. The idea was that if you breed a superior uh, breed with a lower breed, then the result will be something which is uh, lesser, inferior than the um, superior breed. So here then they, they had this idea of selective breeding, so that you have two su superior breeds that you uh, have them reproduce to produce even a more superior um, species. And here then, of course, they, they applied these principles to human populations, right? So here then we have uh, uh, the professor, professor Ward, uh, writing in, I believe it is in 1915, I believe, but please do not quote me, or early 20s, I'm not sure, I will, I, will, I will check. So should we not exercise at least the same care in admitting human beings that we are exercising in relation to animals, to insect pests, or to disgrace, or to disease germs? And he will assert, yet there are certain parts of Europe from which no aliens should be allowed to enter this country for reasons which are eugenically of the first importance, right? And of course, the certain parts of Europe is Southeastern Europe, um, including Greece. 
Uh, by the way, uh, and what is interesting, of course, and if I go, if I will go back, what is interesting, the eugenics principles really uh, were directed against immigrant women because according to this ideology, immigrant women were the number one threat because they will be reproducing inferior races in the United States, right? So, uh, and that's why many, we have, um, we have uh, documents, testimonies, where immigrant women will, particularly in Utah and in other places, um, immigrant women will be very hesitant to go to doctors, fearing that these doctors will be Ku Klux Klan members and they will sterilize them and they will use midwives instead. So we do have then a testimony by uh, Emily Papanicolas uh, uh, in early 2000, uh, the prominent Greek American historian Helen Papanicolas wrote a biography of her parents, um, George and Emily. And then she, uh, she interviewed her mother, and Emily, right, she uh, shared this with her. And then uh, this is then part of the documents that we have. Uh, why do you do this to us? Emilia asked the husband of the Robbie's neighbor, a railroad break, uh, brakeman. It's not you Greeks who are after Miss Zissi, he said, is the black people. That night, Emilia dreamed she was sleeping. In her dream, she opened her eyes. The brakeman was at the open door, the open window, I'm sorry. We are all Ku Klux Klan, he said. She awoke, her skin clammy, right? So the Klan then in many ways was colonizing uh, uh, the immigrants and they were in many ways anxious of uh, what the Klan could do to them. And in fact, uh, the, the Papa Nicholas family did very well uh, eventually in Salt Lake City. Um, they built a home and the home was burned. And they were suspecting that the clan did this um, to them, right? So they were the enemy. Uh, speaking about eugenics, uh, I will just, uh, this is an aside, but I think it's important for us to also register this, that in many ways, the ideology of eugenics shaped laws making inter interracial marriage illegal, right? Again, the idea was that black people were inferior, therefore, their marriage with white people will result to the deterioration of the American race and the American people. Therefore, uh, they set laws, they created laws that will um, in many ways uh, prohibit these uh, unions. Some of them um, were valid until the 1960s. And here I should mention uh, Johnny Otis. He was born uh, Ioannis Veliotis. Johnny Otis is a famous um, rock and roll musician. And he, he was born in, uh, in San Francisco and he fell in love with an African-American uh, person. He very much assimilated into African-American culture, but he had to move to um, uh, uh, Nevada in order to marry because uh, in the 1940s, I believe, because, um, uh, because of the, uh, these laws, he could not marry in San Francisco. He wrote a, a wonderful autobiography if you are interested. All right, so where did the immigrants encounter racism and how, right? They would read the newspapers, uh, scam of Europe, a vicious element unfit for citizenship, popular magazines, scholarship like um, such as um, Fairchild's, the science, the eugenics and public science, right? Perhaps you have heard about the science action in Chicago uh, in restaurants, no rats, uh, no Greeks allowed. And um, for those immigrants who did not know English, of course, it was the Greek language press that will pick up these representations and they will, uh, the press will inform immigrants that this is the situation, right? So we do have here then the representation of the Greeks as inferior, as a threat in generally in public culture, in the, in the print culture, but also in actual social life, segregation in theaters, in Utah, for example, intimidations, 
anti-Greek riots that we will be speaking about, boycotting of business that in many ways led to the establishment of Achepa, mine camps, burning of crosses in the neighborhoods as we saw in restrictive real estate covenants. This, this assault on Greek pride, it was deeply felt because the Greeks had this sense of self-worth, the sense of isotimia. And some of them even had ideas that they were superior. Uh, they came with ideas that they are the descendants of the ancient Greeks and therefore better than the Anglo-Saxons, right? I'm just following what some of the immigrants uh, believed. So here then we have an assault on the Greek um, self-worth. And the immigrants, of course, did not remain passive. In many ways, they were reacting to these kinds of um, situations. Uh, one more example of intimidation. The clan was very much concerned that the new immigrants who were poor and who were discriminated, they may create alliances with African-Americans who were also poor and discriminated, and they may, and this then alliance may create strong social movements, and that might lead, let's say, to revolution, right? So the clan was very systematic in intimidating the new immigrants and reminding them that if you um, socialize with African Americans, if you show your solidarity, you will be punished. And we have here. Then a testimony, uh, again, uh, this is from George Leber's The Order of Achepa, The History of Achepa. Young Greek men in the South were taken along with young Black men from their jobs by the KKK to lynching parties in the woods as a means of intimidation, where Greeks were roughed up and were told to leave town. The Black men were not so fortunate and were lynched. So there is here then a relative um, uh, a difference in the privileges of being a European American versus an African American. Uh, I would like to share here um, a, a story that is also forgotten. Uh, my, my, my Greek American students have not heard about it. And this is George Tick, uh, I'm sorry, Louis Tikas and the uh, Ladlow right, uh, massacre when the immigrant workers were. Um, uh, striking for decent um, working conditions. And Louis Tikas was murdered in, in 1914. He was a Cretan immigrant who very much who assimilated very quickly, but he assimilated into the um, working class movement, the labor movement. And uh, Colorado, Greek Americans, um, including Acheba, they made a point to erect a statue in the town of Trinidad, where he was buried. Uh, the large scale anti-Greek riots, so there are many, there were many. Uh, I'm listing four. The first one perhaps is in Roanoke, Virginia, 1907, South Omaha, Nebraska, 1909, Toronto, Canada, 1918, and Price, Utah, 1923. Uh, what we have, at least in the first three, we have a situation where an immigrant commits a crime or he allegedly commits a crime. And then rumors spread across the town that now the immigrants are attacking us. They are being emboldened. There are uh, town meetings, there are public gatherings, the newspapers pu uh, publish anti-Greek uh, editorials. There are speeches against the Greeks and then there are riots. There are attacks on the neighborhoods with vast, many times with vast destruction of their uh, poverty. The Roanoke, Virginia situation, we know a great deal and, and the, 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 the riot which resulted in um, nine Greek restaurants being wrecked and three Greek shoeshine parlors and two Syrian shops it started with a dispute over Bill, and we have here a good documentation of what the clan was doing in Greek-owned restaurants. So the clan had developed a specific tactic to aggravate Greek restaurant owners. The restaurateur state, or that was interviewed right, stated that KK members would go into Greek restaurants and order huge meals. 
When it came time to pay, they would insist they had given the cashier a $10 bill. In actuality, they only handed over, over $5. And to avoid confrontations, the restaurant owner usually acquiesced to what amounted to a free meal. In this particular case, in the riot, the Greek restaurateur did not consent, confronted the clan. The clan then spread rumors that the Greeks attack natives, locals, therefore they deserve to be punished. Uh, another very well documented um, in, uh, incident is the Toronto uh, 1918 riot. There is here, I, I will not uh, explain the riot, but there is a documentary available. Uh, it is for, uh, on, uh, free access uh, on YouTube, and the title is Violent August, the 1918 Anti-Greek Riots in Toronto. I was interviewed for this documentary when I was about 22 years ago, so you will have a chance also to see me uh, a bit younger <laughs> than I am today. The, uh, and there is, of course, the South Omaha. Uh, please, excuse me. We have the South Omaha, Nebraska. And here we have a, a Greek immigrant killing a policeman. And we do have various conflicting versions of this story. But the idea was that the policeman, he was Irish born policeman, saw a, a, a Greek immigrant um, dating a white girl, 17 year old. Some say she was a prostitute. Some say that she was his a teacher in English. Some say she was both. But nevertheless, um, they get into a violent confrontation. The Greek kills the policeman. He um, uh, testifies that he did this in defense, but what happened as a result, uh, the whole town is being mobilized and they are just not only destroying all the properties, and here we see an example of the um, hotel, the Greek hotel at the time, and but if they drive all the Greeks out from the town. So what we have here is, and, and these, these incidents are uh, covered widely by the Greek language press. So the Greek immigrants know about them. And the lesson they get is that the, the wrongdoing of one Greek may have tremendous negative effects on the entire Greek immigrant community. And therefore, there's a great deal of um, emphasis now to start developing the positive reputation of the Greek immigrants. Uh, so in many ways, then that was one way to defend themselves, to prove to the uh, Americans that they are not troublemakers, that they are not in many ways a threat, but they are willing to be good neighbors and good um, citizens. The, uh, the next development development in our story is the First World War, when we have very clearly the uh, a strong Americanization, aggressive movement, we, where assimil assimilation becomes 100% assimilation, becomes a political and cultural imperative. And this is from a speech that uh, President Roosevelt gave in 1916. Uh, a year before the United States ent uh, entered the, the First World War. And here we do have the very unambiguous, right, straightforward uh, claim that we do not tolerate hyphenated Americanism. We must have straight Americanism. Let us be neither Greeks nor Trojans, but Americans. Uh, we are fake to this country if we rank ourselves as German Americans or English Americans or Irish Americans. So here then we have the situation where being a hyphenated American, I, uh, Irish American, German American, Greek American was considered a political threat to the nation that was going into war. Now, both Greece, uh, Greece was fortunate both in the First World War and the Second World War that Greece was on the side of the United States of the Allies. But for um, demographics that were on the other side, the Germans, for example, German immigrants during the um, First World War or Japanese um, Americans, and to some extent, Italian Americans during the Second World War, 
then these populations uh, faced all kinds of discrimination. Actually, the pressure to Americanize decimated the very thriving German culture. Uh, again, because the German Americans were considered a potential political and cultural threat to the United States. So we do have all, then all kinds of iconography and rituals that promote now this political project of 100% Americanization, the melting pot idea that you see here, everything boils the differences and become an American. We do have Americanization classes when symbols of American identity are everywhere. And what is interesting also, the industry is very much embracing 100% Americanization because it was to, to its benefits to assimilate immigrants to the um, work habits of industrial work. These immigrants, for the most part, were agricultural farmers in their homelands. They had different patterns of work or rhythms of work. Uh, they would take a break uh, whenever they felt it was too hot. They were in many ways independent to decide when they needed to take a break. break. And also they had seasonal var variety in their uh, tasks. But here, let's say in a Ford company, they would work, let's say, from eight to six, and they were doing the same automated um, uh, movements again and again and again. It was a different kind of discipline that the corporations needed. And then, uh, although the corporations were very much pro-immigration, right, uh, fighting the nativist uh, reservations because the corporations benefited from the availability of large numbers of uh, immigrants, of course, that gave them the opportunity to um, have uh, available inexpensive um, labor. So here then we have the icon of the immigrants going to the melting pot uh, with their um, native costumes and then exiting the melting pot now as Americans. And that was actually staged as a ritual in ceremonies, in, what, in a graduation ceremonies of uh, Americanization schools organized by the Ford Foundation where the immigrants will step with their, uh, come up to the stage in their native costumes. They will go into this enclosed structure. They will change the clothes and then they will come up as proper Americans. So when we speak about assimilation and then moving towards the AHEPA strategies of assimilation, we must ask ourselves assimilation to what? Uh, and there were three major routes of assimilation. One was, as I mentioned, working class Americanism. And that was followed by many workers in um, the Intermountain West, Colorado, Utah, uh, and New Mexico. And here they were joining the labor movement, asking, and there were, the labor movement was not uniform. There were radical uh, units within the uh, labor movement, but it was also mainstream um, uh, uh, branches that were seeking for decent American wages, safe workplace conditions, and paid overtime. The second route, the one that uh, was pursued, followed um, by Ahepa, was embrace 100% Americanization. And we have an early form of hyphenated Greek American identity, the Greek American Progressive Association, GAPA, that in many ways it has withered um, uh, throughout history, but nevertheless, it was established in 1923 in many ways offering an alternative to AHEPA. Uh, so when we speak then about AHEPA, uh, we should be thinking about their strategies of assimilation. I think this is a fascinating chapter in terms of how AHEPA uh, in many ways, utilized their identities to project themselves as an American first and foremost group with Hellenic ties, not Greek ties, but Hellenic ties. I will explain in a second. I should mention that my sources on this topic is are mostly from scholarship and some archives, but I did not have access to uh, the Ahepa archive. Uh, my colleague, uh, historian Alexander Kitroev, was granted access to this archive and he published very recently actually a book based on the archive on the history of AHEPA. I would like us here to just have a, a kind of to 
a, a very brief theoretical point, a very basic, I think, concept that immigrant identifications change and are shaped by experiences, by problems, including need for protection from exploitation and racism, as well as beliefs and ideology, right? Identities are shaped in relation to broad narratives of identity, and these narratives of identity are produced by organizations like AHEPA, institutions like the church, or the Greek government, or the American government, right? And identity is expressed strategically to serve the interest of a section of an immigrant group. For example, the working class um, Greek immigrants used a different strategy than the middle class Greek immigrants. And this point, I think, is, is uh, necessary for us to uh, note uh, as we will be uh, uh, then uh, be discussing the Achepa strategy, right? So identity then is expressed strategically in relation to, in this case, of what the dominant home society expects from the immigrants. It is a power relation here. And sometimes you don't have much room to negotiate. So individuals then negotiate these broad identities. Uh, in this talk, uh, prim primarily we'll be looking at Achepa's official identity narrative, although I recognize that at the grassroots level, uh, not all Achepa members fully agreed with the organization's official policy, and also that the organization, of course, changed um, through time. For Achepa, right, the Achepa was founded by Greek businessmen. Uh, in Atlanta, where the Ku Klux Klan had its headquarters, and where um, it, it's some, it, at a point where the business owners, the restaurant owners, the uh, confectionery owners, uh, they really felt the aggression of the Klan. Um, uh, the, the Klan attacked businesses, it intimidated American uh, waitresses not to work. Um, uh, for the Greeks, it will boycott Greek businesses. So here then we have a real problem that hurts the emerging now middle class business owing class. So the Achepa then is emerging to protect the class interests of this demographic. And here we have a, a, an interesting, I think a very clear um, uh, explanation of what drove um, Achepa. Many Greek-owned confectionaries and restaurants failed financially or were sold at sacrificial prices to non-Greeks because of boycotts instigated by the Klan. Greek establishments doing as much as $500 to $1,000 a day business, especially in the South and the Midwest, dropped to as little as $25 a day. So, and here we have an example from um, uh, Dan Georgiakis's biography to illustrate the fear that business, Greek business owners felt, and they knew that if they would uh, challenge the segregation codes, even in the North, in Detroit, Dan Georgiakis speaks about Detroit, that they would be paying a huge price. So Dan says then, I asked my father why his bar was racially segregated. I knew he had no personal animus towards Blacks. So I wanted to know why Blacks were not really welcomed into his bar. He replied that the sportsman's bar, like all the worker bars on Jefferson Avenue, was already segregated when he arrived in the city. Greek bar owners, even if they had wanted to do so, were in no position to challenge the color line. The result would have been empty stools and tables at the least, more likely broken windows, smashed heads, and possibly worse. Uh, I strongly recommend uh, this book by um, Anne Flesser uh, Beck, who wrote very recently, the book was published. She wrote about Greek confectionaries in Illinois and how the Greeks came to dominate the confectionery business in the state. Uh, and although there was prejudice, uh, many of these immigrants, the, many of these confectioners became cultural hubs, even for the, not only for the white middle class of the town, but also for the elite. And here she draws a connection between uh, the Masonic lodges uh, and Americanization. She makes the point, and I quote, uh, 
The Masons served as one means by which Greek immigrants were Americanized. And it's interesting that she adds that the Masons were one of the largest single groups from which the clan drew its members. So here then we have interesting dynamics that we need obviously to research deeper and it might be very difficult to find archival resources. But nevertheless, this is the situation then. The Greeks, as we will see, um, are embraced uh, by the uh, white people in many communities, particularly when their businesses are not competing directly with local businesses. Uh, and what we have, and, and that will lead us to the establishment of Achepa in the 1920s, the clan now has achieved its political goal. About uh, 40,000 of the Greek immigrants leave the United States and return to, the, uh, to Greece, either be because they have not made it to the middle class, they were still workers and they did not see any future for them, or because they could not take these kinds of pressures, or because they didn't like uh, generally the situation, but for those who stayed, right, the, so there were a demographic that wanted to stay, and then for clan, then the next step after closing the door of, uh, of uh, immigration, after its restrictionist policies, the next step is to push for 100% Americanization. It is very interesting, the, the idea of the immigrants totally assimilating is very much part of American history. And here we have an example of the Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams in 1820, the immigrants to America must cast off the European skin, never to resume it. And we have a similar and analogous situation we hear with um, the Achepa. Uh, Anna Karpathakis interviewed um, an um, elder who was an Achepa member, and this is what he says. Uh, you became American by giving up your parents' ways because they also had to give up the way of their parents so they wouldn't stand out like a sore thumb. By growing up, by giving up, by giving up the old world ways, we ran away from being Greek. We married non-Greek blonde women. And here we see, of course, an exaggeration, right? Um, uh, many Achepans actually went to Greece in 1928 to find um, Greek matches because, again, not all, all Greek, not all American women found uh, the immigrants as desirable um, marriage partners. But nevertheless, the statement speaks about the approach of the time that you give away your old world ways. The, so the Achepa constitution, right, is an example of a strategy of 100% assimilation. Uh, assimilation. Uh, I'm quoting here from its constitution. It advances and promotes pure and undefiled Americanism. And it wants to educate the Greeks in the manner of democracy and government of the United States and to instill the deepest loyalty to the United States. So here then we have a dramatic moment in the history of um, Greek America and Greek immigrant America. Here the loyalty changes, shifts radically from the, from the loyalty to the historical homeland Greece now to the new home for the immigrants. Uh, some of the strategies to abandon external Greek cultural characteristics, clothes and facial hair, which something which I um, uh, call the assimilated immigrant body, adopt English as the official language, abandon the sign Greek from its identity. Remember Roosevelt's speech saying, there is no room for a Greek hyphen because the Greek at that time pointed to loyalty to Greece. So here then we have uh, foregrounding the connections with the classical past, hence Hellenism, which was equated with Americanism. And another strategy was for Achepa to extend honorary membership to uh, a selected demographic of Americans and these uh, members should be um, white and Christian. Uh, let us see some examples of the immigrant male body. We see the Cretans here. They were taking photographs to send to their relatives. We see here a photograph from the Cafe Neon, which was a male hub at the time. 
And they are branding guns and um, they are also holding uh, bottles of alcohol, in many ways trying to communicate to the relatives back home that they found prosperity in America. Let us look at this photograph um, a little bit carefully. And you see here a portrait of an immigrant. And then we see the Ahepa, right? And uh, uh, a dramatic, of course, difference is that now the mustaches, right? The mustaches are gone, right? The mustache at the time was a sign of masculinity. You were not a man at the time if you were not wearing an impressive pink mustache. But here, as part of the Ahepa strategy to shed away uh, markers of old world culture here, then I think only one individual sports a very thin uh, trimmed mustache. So here then we do have uh, the Americanized body. Uh, also, we do have the issue of the Greek immigrants and the ancient Greeks. The, the Greeks very quickly realize that the ancient Greek past is very much admired in the United States. Here is an example from the 1928 in St. Louis, Missouri, where a replica of Parthenon is being built on top of a skyscraper at the time, or even earlier in 1919, we have the Greek theater and colonnade, examples of neoclassicism in American cities. And of course, Greek immigrants see these monuments and in many ways they say, oh, wait a minute, we are also connected with Greece, right? So here then is an opportunity for us to claim that we are the descendants of the, the ancient Greeks that we connect with the classical past without this being a contradiction with being an American. Uh, I would like to share with you an, a, a photograph that many people say and a photograph is a thousand of words. And here we have an interesting photograph and I apologize, it is not as clear as it should be. And I should also give credit here to the National Hellenic Museum uh, for, for making public this, pho the, uh, this photograph. It is the same event photograph from a different angle. And here we have an extraordinary alignment of Greek and American identities. The time is 1917, I'm sorry, 1918, summer, Greece has joined the Entente, the Allies in, uh, during First World War I. The victory is anticipated. Um, so the, the occasion is celebration of 4th of July. So here then you have the Greek community in Washington, DC celebrating the 4th of July, an American institution, in front of the US Treasury, which is a building built with in a neoclassical style, which celebrates the upcoming victory of Entente, where Greece and the United States are allies. So here then we have, and we see, we, if that were clearer, we would see that this contingency here is dressed in um, ancient warrior uh, armory. Uh, Greek ancient um, armory. So here then we have an incredible alignment between being Greek, uh, being connected with classical Greece and being connected with an American identity. There is no contradiction whatsoever. It is interesting here to note that nativists refuted the connection between the Greek immigrants and the ancient Greeks. Uh, intellectuals of the movement vilified the mongrel race of Italians and Greeks whose ancestors, and I'm quoting here, whose ancestors had mixed their pure blood with that of inferior races result, resulting in the dissolution of their civilization. And I have a saying was to convince the American public that the middle-class immigrants represented cultural continuity. And the way they did it it was by flaunting the newfound socioeconomic mobility. Very visibly in parades, as we will see, they would make, they would perform, this is the word, they would perform their newfound success. And this was important if we consider the uh, discourse, the conversation at the time. And here again, I'm quoting from Fairchild. Remember the anthropologist from Yale. And he would say, I quote, the business of the alien is to go into the mines, the foundries, the shores, the stifling air of factories and workshops, out on the roads and railroads, in the burning sun of summer or the driving sleet and snow. If he proves himself a man and rises above his station and acquires wealth and cleans himself up, very well we receive him after a generation or two. 
but at present he is far beneath us and the burden of proof rests with him. A classic example of social Darwinism, uh, they, the immigrants have to demonstrate that they fit and they, the demonstration will be valid if they move to um, uh, socioeconomically, right? So here then we have implicitly, but in a way that will not be missed by many people at the time, that in many ways, this is the answer of the middle class to Fairchild's um, claim. So if he acquires wealth and cleans himself out, very well, then he's one of us, right? It is very interesting, and it is important to note this, that in order to protect its class and ethnic interests, Ahepa refrained from antagonizing or challenging the clan. From the uh, Ahepan perspective, and this is a quote that expresses this perspective, this point of view, the Ahepa deemed it necessary to organize under the same principle, principles as those whom we intended to convert. Right. So the idea here is that we will become part of the system and we will change the system from inside. That's the implicit message. It was very interesting that Ahepa's charter was drawn up by Carl Hutchinson, hence the uh, reference to pure and undiluted uh, Americanism. Uh, he was a staunch anti-Catholic um, advocate in public school system. And also it was very interesting that Ahepa would invite uh, clan figures, for example, the editor of the Searchlight, which was a clan publication, to be an honorary speaker at two um, November um, um, Ahepa meetings. Ahepa harvested the dividends of this assimilationism. It was accepted uh, during his conventions in, for example, in New Orleans. It was accepted by city officials. It was praised. It was given the key of the city. As we'll see, there is a little um, there is a little um, documentary that's available on YouTube about. It's not a documentary. There are excerpts, uh, and again we see the Ahepa performing their Americanness dressed in uniform clothes that were modeled after uh, Masonic groups uh, or fraternity organizations. Also in Columbus, later from the 19, um, uh, late 1920s, again, the Achebans were given, uh, they were praised as the fine citizenship that composes this organization. They were patriotic and also public building churches and schools and parks they are open to Achebans. So here then we have a broad public acceptance for the organization. Some concluding observations. Not all, not all Greek immigrants experience nativism and its intensity in an identical manner. Conformity to the racial status quo brought rewards and privileges. Some immigrants visibly embraced the clan's exclusionary practices and even ideology. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, and this is from uh, Gerontakis' work on Ahepa and uh, Americanization. Um, he writes in the 1920s, Greeks were excluded from white men's towns and white men's jobs in Arizona, Idaho, and Colorado. Yet by 1940, had reached the point of othering Mexicans out of Greek owned white only establishments. So here then we have some Greek immigrants uh, reproducing the uh, racial hierarchies and racism that existed in the United States. Uh, and also, uh, there is a, this is a very interesting chapter. I don't have time to, to go into it, but the different routes of assimilation between the working and the middle class brought the two in conflict in many different ways. Uh, also, I think we, in conclusion, we need to uh, complicate the story and not look only at the nativist and racist um, attitudes towards the Greeks, but also instances of intra-Greek immigrant discrimination. We cannot afford to idealize the group. There were all kinds of exploitations um, uh, among the um, 
from labor agents uh, in Utah and Colorado. But for the purposes of this um, presentation, I should mention that there were also instances of intra-Greek immigrant discrimination against Greek Orthodox immigrants from the Ottoman Empire. And also we have evidence that Turkey speaking Greek Orthodox immigrants were heavily discriminated at the same uh, at the time from the Greeks uh, from the uh, who came from the kingdom. And also it is important, I think, to note that the scale of discrimination against Greek immigrants is not comparable with that exercised against non-European Americans. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, Nicholas Gates, perhaps you know him, he wrote an article in the New York Times announcing that it is chic to be Greek. Uh, and here we are today where from, I want you to assimilate 100 years ago, now it is chic to be Greek and kiss me, I'm Greek. Uh, here we have celebration of Greek ethnicity. Um, our American neighbors are flocking our, our festivals. And the question of course is raised is, what, what good does it do for us to know about this history? How do we use this knowledge for what purpose? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Agnostu, for this very excellent lecture. So we will proceed the questions. Uh, we have already four questions. Uh, the first one comes from Gerasimus Kassan. To what extent did a Greek sentiment in the United States determine the way America handled the 1922 events at Smyrna and then subsequent immigration policy? Yeah, um, Gerasimus, this is a great question. Uh, I'm afraid I don't, I will not be able to answer it. Um, I, 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 know, I know that the US ambassador Horton uh, witnessed the um, uh, destruction of Smyrna. He wrote uh, a book about it. So we do have the American point of view. It is very, it's, it's interesting though, that the United States along with the European, the Western Europeans uh, declared neutrality. So they did not uh, go forward to save the crowd, the crowd of people who were trying to escape the burning city. And they would, they desperately, they were diving into the sea to, re to, to save themselves and many of them drowned. Uh, and it was only a Japanese, we know it was a Japanese ship that and Dan Georgiakas, I think, has written about. And there is there's some, some writings about it that they, they uh, extended humanitarian help. But the uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, in many ways, it will be speaking, it will lead us towards the direction of seeing uh, to what extent the, the US and its immigration laws uh, played out in connection now to the new wave of um, uh, refugees from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I know there is a recent dissertation by Yorgo Topalidis uh, from the University of Florida that focuses on this demographic, the Ottoman Greeks, as he calls them. And uh, this is a, a, a topic that is under researched. And I have not read his dissertation. Uh, it is not available yet, actually. I searched for it explicitly in preparation for this lecture, but the university does not make it available yet. He, he, I think he, he graduated this summer. So this is a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful um, path for research. And uh, perhaps you will take it up and, and write an uh, Yerasimus, I should, I should mention that the, um, uh, with Yerasimus, we were graduate students together at Ohio State. That's why I have this familiarity in addressing with him in, in a friendly way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a great, a great uh, area and domain to really um, um, research further. Uh, Yerasimus has a number of questions. Uh, I will get the second one, and then I will try to get questions from others, and then I will come back to him. 
the, his second question is, how does Fairchild define average American? How, how did he define what, I'm sorry? Defines average Americans. Average Americans. That's interesting. Um, right, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's a good observation. Uh, in many ways, it is uh, a generalization that an anthropologist, right? Uh, it is a generalization that an anthropologist would not make, right? And uh, Fairchild is, um, is it was an anthropologist. So yes, it's, it is a general category that doesn't tell us much how he defines an average American. Uh, but I think rhetorically speaking, he tries to point out a particular zeitgeist, a particular ethos at the time that was circulating at the time. Certainly average American, the average American was not the person who was let's say committed to the social progressives. Uh, an average American was not, let's say, uh, the leaders of many labor unions that wanted, for a number of reasons that if you would like to discuss, they wanted to draw the immigrants into uh, the union. Uh, so the, who was the average American? Um, uh, uh, that's, that's, I think, a, a, a kind of a weak way to speak about a, a, a popular sentiment. But as we saw, as we saw in the uh, National Geographic example and the publication by the uh, Professor Ward, we saw that popular culture felt no hesitation to publish ideas that we now in retrospect think that they are absolutely uh, horrible. They are unsubstantiated, the inferiority of the Southeastern Europeans, right? And that breeding, having them breed with white Anglo-Saxons, it will deteriorate the American people. So I think he speaks then about a zeitgeist where um, a general ethos approach to the immigrants where popular culture, including the printed culture, uh, popular magazines like the National Geographic, local newspapers, local newspapers are replete with negative representations of the Greeks. Uh, the American reader would be exposed to these representations and many of these readers will be persuaded to believe these representation. So I think that's the best, the best answer I can give. But it's, I think the burden falls on Fairchild to do that. He should have done a better job. I will take now another question from a person that has not asked any question. Then I will come back to Gerasimus. From Thebi, after Churchill says, heroes fight like Greeks, is it true that Americans held Greek Americans with great respect, greater respect? Uh, so here we are speaking about the context of the Second World War, right? Yes. Because, yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, right. I, well, that was yes. I mean, this is this is a wonderful observation. Certainly, the Second World War marked a watershed moment in um, Greek American history. Uh, it was. Life magazine in its cover that featured an F zone with the Acropolis in the background, really hailing the heroism of the Greeks. And then the Churchill uh, statement was also included. Uh, the, 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 the heroic resistance of the Greeks against Mussolini was a great news for the democratic Europe and the United States because it gave an example that the fascist military machine could be defeated. Of course, right, the circumstances of the war, the, ter the mountainous territory in many ways uh, benefited to some extent the Greeks, but it is undoubtedly the Greeks resisted the, uh, the, 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 the Mussolini fascist army heroically, and it's very interesting uh, with a, a development that happened in Hollywood 
uh, with uh, Skouras. Skouras was one, a Greek, a Greek immigrant who made it big in the film industry in Hollywood. And he was able to uh, mobilize the Hollywood community the actors, uh, uh, people in the radio programs, that they would mobilize to raise humanitarian funds for Greece. And you will have then uh, radios in every American town calling the American people to support the fighting Greeks. And then later in, in the winter of 1941, one was the devastating right, humanitarian crisis in Greece, and particularly in Athens with the famine, where about 300,000 Athenians died because of the blockade. I will not go into details. Mazower's book um, uh, does a wonderful job in explaining. Uh, we do have then an American mobilization on behalf of the Greeks. And it's very interesting now that the positive press that the, Greek, the Greeks receive in many ways empowers the Greek American community to go public and mobilize itself on behalf of Greece, which is now an ally. So support for, again, there is no uh, contradiction. Uh, helping Greece at the time of crisis also meant uh, helping the allies to defeat Nazism, and they will have then the, the formation of uh, the, the Greek American War Relief Association. Uh, explicitly, we see Greek American, American born children dressed in fustanelles in the traditional costumes, um, uh, celebrating the Greek resistance and asking um, uh, Americans to help. And also, what we see in this mobilization now for Greek Americans, both as Americans and Greeks. And what they do, of course, they do it in close, uh, they get the okay from the State Department, right? They get the approval of the State Department. So they have the stamp of approval by the American government. And what we see in this particular situation, we see now as how in many ways assimilated are the Greeks in the sense that they can now negotiate, they can um, enter into a dialogue with American institutions, the, the US government, but also the Red Cross, other local organizations in order now to coordinate this tremendous right, humanitarian aid to Greece. So here then the, the Second World War absolutely is a watershed that for Greek America, a, a, uh, resulted to all kinds of uh, positive things for the community. A, confidence, uh, empowerment, uh, the fact that now the American, the American um, public does not dismiss Greece as something corrupt, as something which is uh, a liability, but as something which is positive, an ally, and celebrate the Greek people and by extension, the Greek Americans. So absolutely then, um, in many different ways, uh, the Second World War experience makes the Greeks now start thinking that uh, they can be more visible and more confident in expressing their ethnic identity in public. In the 1920s and 30s, their identities were much more in the private sphere and within the communities. Also, we do have, we have, a, we have an incredible footage uh, in New York City where all the ethnic groups, and the US is about to enter the war, and all the ethnic groups uh, are parading of course, there is the, the call for national unity in the time of war. And we have the Greek Americans in New York City parading in their costumes, carrying the American and the Greek flag and carrying a miniature, miniature replica of the Parthenon. So here then we have the first signs of the public display of the assimilated Americans as Greek Americans. Something, of course, that will be taking place at a different scale during the ethnic revival in the 1970s, when we have the festivals and the parades and so forth and so on. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Kos. 
it's uh, shortened, I suppose, cost us possibly. Thank you for an informative lecture. Do you think a HEPA's Americanization campaign accounts for the fact that many Greek Americans have neglected to help fight for the, child, for the civil rights of Black Americans? Oh, that's uh, that's that's a wonderful uh, question, and I'm I'm, I'm glad to hear um, this question that in many ways um, uh, kind of shifts the discussion in a framework where we think about Greek Americans not only in relation to the dominant group, uh, but also in relation to other peoples like African Americans. Uh, it is a complicated story, uh, and it is an important story that we must tell. Uh, I should say that the, the relationship between Greek Americans and African Americans uh, er, early in the 20th century, right, bef even before Ahepa, it was extremely complex. You don't, we don't have one attitude. For example, we do have the example of Tarpon Springs. Tarpon Springs in Florida, the, the Greek sponge divers, right, uh, are uh, facing tremendous resistance by the local sponge divers. Uh, the locals boycott the Greek efforts who are demographically, they are a, a good size. And then of course, the, the, the Greeks cannot find workers for their businesses. So they turn to African-Americans. So in many ways then they do not practice Jim Crow uh, segregationism. And what is more interesting and more important to notice is that they pay them the wages that they would pay to anyone. So in other words, then they do not discriminate wages in relation to African Americans. So this is then one particular regional situation where the Greeks in, are very strong in a particular occupation. They have particular economic needs and they turn to uh, African Americans. Also, we know in Detroit in the 1960s, uh, when many American restaurants will not serve Black Americans uh, jurors, uh, uh, restaurants very close to the, uh, the, the, uh, the municipal co uh, court. So the, the Coleman, the, the, the mayor of Detroit approaches the Greek restaurateur, says, are you willing to accommodate African Americans? They say, yes. And then the African-Americans felt welcomed and they will continue then to uh, frequent the places. So here then we have all kinds of interesting interactions. We have also another situation, speaking about now the deep south, uh, where racism is deep. Uh, lynching is a routine, lynching of African-Americans, and where you cannot possibly challenge the um, Jim Crow without uh, paying a huge price. Uh, here we have a situation where um, uh, the initial immigrants, uh, economically speaking, they occupy uh, the position of what people call middlemen minorities. Middlemen minorities are groups which operate both in minorities stigmatized both in the environments of minorities but also in the dominant society so the greeks then would open uh restaurants in black neighborhoods and they will uh, serve to black americans and they would socialize and they would have a good positive relationship they're not there was no animosity there was as far as we can tell but at the same time, they would go, they would drive home or they would take the tram home to their white neighbor, neighborhoods. And these middle men minorities then will be also accepted by the white majority. There is this uh, work uh, which uh, makes the case, convincing case, that the assimilation of the Greeks in the American South, which was much faster than the assimilation elsewhere because that was a non-industrial um, region. The Greeks, uh, for the most part, uh, had occupations that were not in direct competition with locals. They were accepted by the white community. They would be able to buy houses in this uh, uh, 
in these um, uh, neighborhoods, something that the African Americans could not do. African Americans could not open business in a white neighborhood. So here then we're speaking about uh, the privileges. The, of course, in order to, if you're a businessman, and here we're speaking about mostly men, if you're a businessman, you have to learn the language, you have to uh, socialize with the customer, you have to be friendly to the customer in an appropriate way. So here then the conditions are pressuring the Greeks to assimilate as fast as possible. Yes, we had the Roan Nokia uh, riot, but that was in 1907. Uh, so what we see here is um, a, a situation where there are situations where the, the the immigrants are socializing with the African-Americans, but we do see, I'm going back now to the, the crux of your question about the Ahepa. Uh, Ahepa did not confront directly the Klan, uh, did not confront the, uh, the atrocities that the Klan was committing um, in the South at the time. I don't know, and I, I need to see the archives to know whether there were efforts from inside to do so. Uh, but certainly what we see in the South among the Greeks, the Greek immigrants, there is a, a decisiveness, decisive decision not to rock the racial boat, the, the racist boat. And we saw that also uh, even in the 1960s uh, during the civil rights movement when Yakovos takes a very public stance, and perhaps the audience would know about this history. Uh, Yakovos takes many risks. And he was the, he's the first white religious leader to march side by side with Martin Luther King Jr. in 1965, I believe it was March 25th, in Selma, Alabama, in support of the civil rights. Ahepa is reported uh, in, the, in the readings I have done, Ahepa supported Yakovos at the time, 1965. But the Greek American now communities in the South were extremely upset and angry and even hostile to the Archbishop because they felt that Yakovos's public support jeopardized their interests. Uh, they might, it might turn the locals against the um, now established businessmen. And how do we know about this uh, visceral and hostile reaction? We know it by letters that these people sent to Yakovos, and they are available in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese archives. And what we see here, we see two major trends among those who oppose uh, to um, civil rights. A, fear, uh, they may, the locals may associate the Greeks uh, as anti Jim Crow and therefore they may attack us. Or with, there are examples, there is a dissertation, uh, I can share it with you if you're interested, uh, that looked into the archive and a number of Greek Americans internalized Jim Crow racism. They, do, they did believe that African Americans um, uh, uh, are inferior. We, we do have, in conclusion, uh, we do have, and we all, we're all expecting an incredible uh, historical work by Andrew Manis. Andrew Manis is a historian. He has already published an article about how this dynamic between the archdiocese. So here then, we, what do we have in this situation of the Yakovos? We have the official position, the official stance of an institution, the Greek Orthodox Church. And we have leaders uh, and uh, uh, people in the hierarchy which support him. And then you have the grassroots people. And here then we have all kinds of internal um, dissension and conflict and disagreement. So uh, uh, Andrew Man uh, Professor Andrew Manis looked at how this played out in a, a, a parish in Birmingham, Alabama, where the, the um, priest, I'm trying now to recall the name, it escapes me. The priest is uh, both a, a friend and a supporter of Yakovos. He takes a position supporting and defending Yakovos. 
And then the Paris Council is absolutely against it. And we have all kinds then of internal conflicts and the parish is divided. So the, the, the history then, the history of um, the, uh, the relationship between Greek Americans and African Americans is um, complex. I would say that the Ahepa situation is a political decision where uh, the institution is opting not to rock the boat not to challenge racism, which in many ways is, 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 is a contradiction. On the one hand, Ahepa was saying that we are embracing American ideals, the American ideal of democracy, uh, but the Klan represented exactly the opposite. It went against American ideals of equality, of equal rights, of um, respect for human lives. I mean, basic uh, human and civil rights. And in that sense, uh, uh, for the reasons I explained, Ahepa took this particular position. And again, uh, it, it, it set an example for some people to, or it was a lesson for some uh, business people to, again, as, as I mentioned in the example I offered, to exclude now Mexicans or African-Americans uh, from the restaurants. So that's that's the best I can do. Of course, there is uh, there is the the, the 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 story continues with the Black Lives Matters and the El Pido Foros is um, public stance as well. Uh, the, uh, there is there is a documentary in the making. Uh, I think there is not a thing. There is about twenty minutes of it. If you're interested, I could please email me. Uh, I am at Ohio State in the Department of Classics. I could share this material. Um, um, with you, but at the same time also, in, for conclusion, what is interesting also, it's interesting how Jacobus tried to justify his intervention into an American strife, and it was a big strife, the civil rights movement. Uh, Jacobus decided that he should Americanize the church, and in many ways that the church was now an American institution, it was not an immigrant institution in the 1950s and 60s, uh, and in many ways, it felt that it is the responsibility of the church also to be a player uh, in an active agent, so to speak, in American social and political life. And he had to justify his position, which was controversial. It was controversial uh, not only in the American South, but also in the racist sex sectors of the North and the West, and also it was controversial for his flock. And he had to justify it both theologically and ethnically. So the, the two lines then of his argumentation were, A, uh, we are a Christian church, and love, ecumenical love, is our cardinal principle. And we cannot be, you cannot stand uh, to stay the margins and see our fellow Americans, the Black Americans, being subjected to racist violence. This is against our principles of universal love. That was one of his arguments. Uh, the second argument he made was personal, and in a way he hoped that it will, it will resonate with the Greek Orthodox people. And, he, and his, his interview, parts of this interview are available on YouTube, and he said, he, he grew up in Ottoman Turkey. And he said, uh, I know firsthand what it means to be a second class citizen. I know firsthand what it is, how it feels to be subjected to violence, to be subject to situations where you have to hide your religion and your identity. I was raised in a situation where injustice vis-a-vis -vis the Greek Orthodox was the everyday routine. So he says, as a Greek Orthodox, but also as an Ottoman subject in Italy who experienced what it means to be a second class citizen, I refuse to stay passive and indifferent to the plight now of the African-Americans. Thank you. The next question is from George Anagnos. 
I think partially you have answered this question. What effect did the 1940 Greco-Italian war on the Greek identity in America? Right. Um, I pretty much, I think I, I covered uh, this domain. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anagnos, uh, for the question. Uh, let me let me for a second just to um, see if I can think of another aspect. Um, no, I think I think I kind of I pretty much covered this uh, this um, topic. But thank you. The yeah. next question is for Thanasi Konomu. The attitude of the American of the Americans towards the immigrant Greeks Greeks changed drastically in late 1950s and early 1960s. Yes. In your opinion, what were some of the reasons for that? Right. Thank you. Yes. Well, that's that's that that's 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 an interesting question that will take us now to what uh, people call uh, the ethnic revival and the uh, now the new the new um, recognition rather the recognition and the um, the love one might say that the um, mainstream America directed towards European Americans um, there are many many reasons uh, one basic reason is that the United States and the United States government explicitly changes its approach to uh, the definition of what it means to be um, an American. The, the context is that the, the whole process starts in the, uh, during the Cold War, where now the world is divided between the democratic West and the Soviet bloc. And the communist and the Americans and the Western Europeans, in many ways, vie for gaining the loyalty and the support of a number of nations, like Cuba, for example, that was, uh, in many ways, that tilted, right, that gravitated towards the Soviet Union. But Cuba is an interesting example uh, uh, to, to illustrate the fact that the two superpowers were trying to influence um, global opinion and get as many allies as possible. For example, for the, the US would have been disastrous from the geopolitical standpoint, let's say, to have, let's say, Africa turn into a communist continent, because that will then increase the global power of communism and that the communism will be a greater threat for uh, the country. So uh, here then, of course, we have, we have a situation now that the Soviet Union in its propaganda, both the US and the Soviet Union are engaged in a global propaganda of their merits and why the populations should um, uh, become their allies. And the Soviet propaganda is scoffing at the uh, American claim that, uh, you know, we are a democracy, we are a free, democracy and we in many ways then exemplify democratic principles. And then the Soviets would say, well, this is absolutely not true because the US claims, the US diplomatic rhetoric claims that the country is free, but then see how they treat African-Americans as second class citizens or how they treat Asian Americans uh, who uh, do not have, let's say, voting rights. So what kind of democracy then are we talking about? Right. So in the context then of the Cold War, the United States is facing external pressures to open up its society, uh, in many ways uh, grant civil rights and become more accommodating to ethnic differences and ethnic diversities. Uh, that's the external pressure. The internal pressure is the civil rights movement that is supported by many white people as well. And also now, as we move into the 60s and 70s, you have, as other groups also see, uh, follow the African-American efforts for respect, for equal rights, and the European-Americans and the Chicanos and other groups that are, uh, they have different power within the racial hierarchies at the time. They try also to put pressure 
on American society to start accepting them. Uh, for example, and this plays out in many, many different aspects of, of, of American life. One aspect is the university. You have Chicanos at UC Berkeley saying that you need to change the curriculum. You need to teach the history of our group and you need to teach our experiences and how we were oppressed because mainstream history and mainstream curriculum is really silencing us. It makes us invisible. So American institutions then are feeling the pressure from inside and you have thousands of students now who feel from minorities who feel empowered to pressure for cultural change. And it's very interesting, think about it, the Greek Americans and the European Americans and the Italian Americans, again, see, they see what is going on and they start also approaching the universities, claiming, you know what? We want you to teach our language. We want you to teach our history. We have proven how loyal Americans we have been. We fought for the uh, during the Second World War for the United States. We raised uh, astronomical amounts of money in war bonds. So we have been then demonstrating our loyalty. And we have been, and there were very explicit references, and I will go into this. Uh, there were very explicit references that somehow um, uh, Amer European Americans felt that they had to hide their ethnicity because that's what they were pressured to do. Uh, although they, there was this resurgence of ethnic pride as we saw during the Second World War. So here then we have situations where Greek Americans also feel emboldened and they start opening up American institutions. And in many ways, my program at Ohio State is the product of this kind of initiative. The local Greek community comes to the administration. It says, we're giving you $40,000 lots of money for the time, hard work, hard earned money, start the curriculum. And the university starts a pilot program. It proves successful. And now the, after, right, we, we have now a long history of presence. Uh, it another, another argument, these European Americans back then, they were called, white ethnics. The white ethnics uh, expressed in books written by intellectuals. Michael Novak is one uh, Slovenian, I believe. He was a Slovenian intellectual who wrote the unmeltable ethnic, uh, who made the case that these groups are oppressed and they want greater visibility in the culture of the United States, right? So we do have then all kinds of, and we see this all across the cultural spectrum. The, as I mentioned, the government is deciding that it's turning multicultural. How do you turn multicultural? Then you pass the uh, Educational Heritage Act where you um, invest millions of dollars in high schools and elementary schools and colleges where now kids, and we have evidence, kids now are uh, encouraged to explore the roots of their families, right? So then kids then are um, encouraged to start identifying as hyphenated Americans. Hence, the American Helene now becomes a Greek American. We do have, I mentioned the, the film by Kazan, um, America, America. We have Roots, uh, the documentary about African Americans that really uh, was a blockbuster. We do have now the the, uh, the ethnic festivals. Uh, uh, I attended the, one of the first festivals in Columbus in the 1980s. It was very thinly attended. Greek food back then, people didn't know about it. And they were hesitant to taste these strange foreign exotic foods. And then, of course, uh, uh, it was a, a systematic opening up of the public sphere, festivals, um, heritage societies, films, documentaries, uh, university programs that were encouraged to promote uh, the search for roots. 
so we do have then this dynamic. Of course, the, the ethnic revival was highly politicized. Um, there was, uh, and it, it divided European Americans. There was the, and this is a big, big um, uh, now topic and for many controversial, but uh, the, it was those white ethnics, European Americans that they accepted what it is called, and perhaps you're familiar with the term, bootstraps ideology, right? The Europeans came, they worked hard, sacrificed, and we succeeded because of our hard work and our hard work alone. And there was the another alternative narrative who says, yes, absolutely, the, the papudes and the yayades, the grandparents and the grandmothers and the fathers, absolutely, they broke their backs. They worked extremely hard, but the European Americans had more privileges than other minorities. So they, in many ways, they benefited uh, by the fact that they were um, accepted as we since, since the 1920s, the segregation is New Orleans opens up its doors to Achiappa. So the, uh, or the confectioners in Illinois are becoming the place to hang out uh, uh, for the white uh, people. So here then we do have a situation where um, um, European Americans do not acknowledge their structural privileges. And um, uh, that's, that's uh, an issue that still I think is why, with us and I have written about it. And one last thing I have to say in, in directly in relation to uh, your uh, question, uh, what is it that it explains the uh, shift of the American public vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Greeks? And in many ways, what, how do we explain the popularity of the Greeks? Uh, I have already defined the structural changes in American society that uh, uh, predispose American people now to accept that they uh, have roots, they are, uh, uh, President Kennedy said, uh, we are a nation of immigrants, right? Famously. Uh, one statement that spoke volumes about now the paradigm shift of what it means to be an American. To be an American is to be from somewhere. He should have added, of course, that we are also a, a nation of um, uh, oppressed Native American Indians and um, slaves. He didn't say that. But nevertheless, uh, we do have then a paradigm shift and the whole society is restructuring to accommodate and promote difference. What, uh, when when um, Nicholas Gage published this editorial in the New York Times, uh, Nicholas Gage was an, an investigative reporter for the New York Times and he really earned his reputation uh, when he, did a, uh, he, he uh, succeeded in a very challenging project to write about the mafia, right? And we can imagine the risks and the difficulties of having access, right, to this um, organization. But nevertheless, he was um, uh, respected a great deal. And he wrote an article, an essay in the New York Times. He was part of the, his, his example is interesting. He, he is employed by the New York Times. And then he uses this power now as he's American born, he's assimilated, he has cultural power. And he writes now an article, an essay to introduce the Greeks to the American public, to the average <laughs> reader. Uh, and he, the question that he starts with is a very interesting, I, I strongly, strongly uh, recommend it for a reading. He starts with the question, how do we explain the popularity of the Greeks. How do we explain, and he, I quote him, that it is chic to be Greek. And he interviews people. He does a great job in uh, kind of identifying the various demographics within the society, the pioneer immigrants of the past, the new immigrants of the post 1960s, the American born, and how they are different. And many times there were tensions. And back then also there were many conflicts over the language of the liturgy. Uh, uh, there were all kinds of stereotyping. So he interviews mostly Greek American men. He really does not do justice to the Greek American women. He, he says, he claims that these women are mostly, they have not been drawn by the feminism, they have not sought to be professionals, they're kind of happy, or they remain within as housewives in the domestic sphere. 
Uh, but he, he neglected, obviously, to take into account all kinds of women. Olivia Dukakis, uh, the actors for one, was making a career um, in New Jersey, next to New York City, where uh, Nicholas uh, was staying. So really, what he, when he was saying this chic to be Greek, uh, he would say it really he meant it chic to be a male Greek. And I will go into this. And when he tries to answer the question, he refers to two films that became blockbusters in the United States at the time, mid 1960s. It, one was Never on Sunday, and the other was um, uh, Zorba the Greek. These films were blockbusters the way my big fat Greek wedding became a, a blockbuster in, in early 2000. And if we seek, and some Greek Americans objected to the uh, Never on Sunday because uh, it, the protagonist, the female protagonist was a prostitute, uh, but they didn't see the allegory of the film, but nevertheless, they would say, why should we have a Greek woman being a prostitute? Uh, but if we look carefully at the films, uh, the Never on Sunday, of course, it was produced by Gilles Dachin. Gilles Dachin was a leftist uh, American who was deported uh, in, the, in the, or he left, he left the United States uh, in the context of McCarthyism who, who had launched the witch hunt against former communists or leftists. Uh, and he left, he went to Paris and then he went to Greece. And he met Melina Mercury, who is the female character in the, in the film and they married. So uh, the film features an American traveler who is in love with ancient Greece. He travels to Greece to find himself because he believes that Western society has lost something. Uh, and this is the spirit, as he says, of ancient Greece. He goes there and he meets uh, Ilya, the prostitute, and her friends, and he tries to change them. He tries to westernize them. And as he tries to do this, he colludes with a shady character. In many ways, he uh, makes an alliance with a person who exploits uh, prostitutes. So the, the idea then is that then the, the, the uh, Greeks resist his impositions. And then we do have an incredible sense, an incredible representation of Greeks as people who are sensuous, who know how to enjoy life as a community, who they connect, who can experience authentic and expressive joy, the kefi, in other words, be in touch with themselves and relate with others. So in many ways, then it represents the Greeks in a manner that was very consistent with the ethnic revival uh, value of ethnicity. Uh, if now we shift the framework in the ethnic revival, one way that drove American people towards their roots and their ethnicity was the alienation they felt in the suburbs. I think it was Norman Mailer who wrote um, a book with the title, uh, The Air-Conditioned Nightmare, referring to now uh, the, all the modern um, amenities of the uh, an American middle-class household, uh, suburbs, uh, order, um, uh, peace, quietness, and these were segregated suburbs, by the way, but somehow the, the people who were feeling alienated, they lost the sense of community and ethnicity in many ways. Uh, Michael Novak call, uh, characterized the European Americans as the network people, the people with social networks, people who, who can still have the capacity in American modernity to connect together, to have meaningful relationships, to, have, uh, to create a meaningful community which was exhibited in their dancing, which was exhibited in the way they came together to prepare their festival foods. That was the image then of the ethnic that, and the, and the Italian Americans and the Greek Americans, they were playing out this image in their festivals. I, I remember in the 1990s when I was in a, in a cultural organization, one, we were discussing the festival, what to feature and what, what we could not, and then one person said, let us, let us do a sirtaki because Americans like that. Americans like this dance. 
to be an ethnic background uh, in many ways answered a, an existential and a cultural issue, the issue of modern alienation. Somehow then ethnicity then was valued for the sense of community they brought. It, it created the sense of closeness and connectivity that it made possible. And for many Americans, it was lost. Hence, the popularity of the roots movement, genealogy, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, so many people, right? Irrespectively of ethnic background, they are looking from their ancestors. They look for family connections. They do create festivals and they do portray a sense of belonging and connectivity. So we have a situation when, where the film Never on Sunday uh, displays a performance of, performance of Greek identity that very much speaks to the uh, center, central cultural element of ethnic revival. And then we have Zorba the Greek. And how does Zorba the Greek ends? Uh, the Zorba and the, the British, um, I believe it's, he's a British Greek, but he's very assimilated, very disciplined, very strict, very oppressed. Uh, and Zorba is exuberant, right? The exuberant, the joy of life. And the project, the joint project of uh, exploiting a mine collapses. And throughout the film, it was based on a novel by Katsantzakis. Uh, Throughout the film, Zorba tries to get the British person to relax, to enjoy life. They fail, and then the British tells Zorba, teach me to dance. And then we have the famous scene in an arid landscape in Crete, the two dancers performing the Sirtaki uh, in an exuberant fashion, the, the British has, wears a tie, he unties he, his tie, he feels now liberated, he comes in touch with himself and his feelings. He's not now the British scripted, disciplined uh, person, but he's opening up. I, I invite you to search in Google the performance by Pelis Savalas, the Brooklyn Greek American, who on American TV, prime time TV, speaking about popularity, right? And speaking about ethnic revival. Now the American TV showcases a Greek performance. And Telly Savalas with his tuxedo, he makes two claims of identity. One claim is I am absolutely so an American, a Brooklyn American with his Brooklyn accent. In parenthesis, the tuxedo implies that he's successful, right? He was, the he was playing Kojak, right, in the film. But he says, at the same time, I am absolutely Greek and nobody can take my Greekness away. A classic example now of a Greek American celebrity uh, feeling bold to claim a hyphenated Greek American identity, something that was not possible in the early, um, in the 1920s. And then what he does, he pours a glass of champagne and then he takes the tablecloth and he says, Opa, and you can imagine what happens, everything breaks, right? Opa, and then a whole group of Greek Americans come on the stage and they do perform again the dance of um, a folk dance, the Sirtaki actually. Again, ethnic togetherness, ethnic community. Uh, Telly also introduces his, his brother, they kiss. Again, he demonstrates the family ties and how close these ethnics are. And they have some values that are important for our society. Closeness. And the, the Greeks would make the case, you know, we are, we are, uh, we are, working hard and in many ways, but we have not lost the um, ability to enjoy life. So the, uh, so the, in, in many ways then, uh, it is also the representation of a very compelling image of Greek identity in uh, American public culture, films, TV, and festivals that created this then uh, image of um, 
a, a community that many American people found irresistible. Thank you. The next uh, question is from an anonymous attendee. Was there any difference in racism against Greeks and Italians? Right, thank you. Um, uh, I'm afraid I cannot answer this question. Um, uh, we know, uh, so both, uh, so the, the short answer is I don't know. And thank you for the question. And I will be reading about them. We have started a project to try to uh, uh, cultivate um, our uh, Greek American and Italian American studies in conversation. So this is important for us to uh, explore further. Uh, we can start just, if we want to kind of start the exploring the, the landscape and, and uh, start asking questions, uh, two, two things come to my mind. One is that both groups are classified under the same principles of nativism, that they are the uh, inferior people from Southeastern Europe, right? So they, they are then the undesirables. And in many ways, the, um, uh, they have to negotiate uh, their own position by using their own cultural resources, right? In this, in, in this particular uh, now comparative framework, it is very useful to ask, uh, although immigrants are feel pressured to demonstrate their Americanness, to assimilate, the way they go about it is different because they draw from different cultural resources. For example, the Greeks have the classical past, which is which was praised at the time. So this was a cultural capital. It was something of value that they could build on, and they could conveniently claim that we are both Americans and we are descendants of the ancient Greeks, and that is no contradiction whatsoever because American culture values the ancient Greeks, right? As, as simple as that. Uh, the, we know that there is no record of uh, a, a, a Greek immigrant being lynched. Uh, Italian Americans were lynched. Uh, there is uh, uh, irrefutable evidence of this, and, they, and that took place in in uh, uh, New Orleans, and again, they fell victims now. They could have been Greek Americans uh, uh, because of the circumstances. There was a, a, mo a, a mob, a, a, a police chief was um, assassinated. Rumors have started that an immigrant did it. And then the mob started indiscriminately attacking people who were marked as immigrants through their clothes, right? Or their mustaches. And they met a group of Italian Americans, and it was lynching. As simple as that. The way, the way in, a, in the Roanoke example of the mob riots, it was also Syrian people who were attacked because they were confused with the Greeks, right? Or we know uh, after when the uh, the United States was attacked in New York City by terrorists, uh, when the the twin towers were, were bombarded, they, there were. Um, a, a mob behavior that attacked Hindu people because they were confused as Muslims, right? So, so all kinds then of situations where the mob does not discriminate between nationalities. Uh, thinking about thinking about the different the differences between uh, Greek immigrants and Italian immigrants at the time, there is a very important difference that we need to take into uh, into account. And this difference is the uh, particular experience of the Greek peasants and the Southern Sicilian peasants in Italy, those who eventually uh, emigrated. The Greeks were part of a market economy. Uh, they, would, they were not subsistence farmers. Uh, they were not tenants uh, of, um, uh, uh, landlords. So they had their own plots of land, small, perhaps arid, but nevertheless, they will participate in the market and they will participate also in global markets. I mean, the, the raising, right, the current, the current market. One of the reasons that many uh, immigrants from the Peloponnese actually came to, towards Chicago in the 1880s 
um, 10 years after the, the Chicago fire, is that the, the current uh, uh, market collapsed so the, uh, for a number of reasons. So the, 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 the farmers were part of a international economic system, uh, but at the local level, they will take their produce to the market, they will negotiate prices, they would handle cash. So they had experience with cash economy. And that was what people call a cultural baggage or a no a valuable knowledge that they brought to the United States. Uh, and many of them, the pioneers, first they went as, um, in the mines in the railroad. Uh, and once they, they, they experienced there the, the, the exploitation, they experienced the racism, and they experienced how dangerous how dangerous, how fatally dangerous the profession was. And once they would accumulate some capital, they will start being vendors and sell stuff from wholesale, right? Fruits, vegetables. They will learn how to make sweets. So they, their, their orientation was towards being independent and, be, and they could somehow understand also with the help of some earlier immigrants also who knew the ropes, but they knew the basics of a cash economy, right? So I do this, I, I sell for profit and I invest a little bit, I save, and then perhaps then I will open a, a small shop that was their orientation. While the Italian immigrants who were uh, uh, working for uh, landlords, they did not have this experience. So the, the Italian immigrants, and here I have to be very careful and avoid generalizations, right? So I'm saying this tentatively, but one could make the case that the Italian Americans stayed with the working class longer than the Greek immigrants that took the route of the business owners, small business owners, uh, because they had, the former did not have an understanding of the market and the latter they did. And of course, as we know, uh, the, the, Ascending middle class, which conformed, was much readily, much more readily accepted than the working class. So this will be a hypothesis that we may start exploring in future research. Uh, but but uh, thank you for the and then now you you give me a lots of uh, food for thought and also will start speaking with my Italian American colleagues who, who have been wonderful. If I can share, if I can share with you a personal experience regarding the the accidents, the mine accidents. This summer, uh, with my colleague Gregory Giusdanis um, here at Ohio State, we did a field trip to Colorado and Utah, and we are very much interested in understanding the life of Louis Tickus. Of course, there is the seminal book by Zissi Papanicolas, Buried and Sung. Louis Tick, as I mentioned him in my presentation, he was a person who learned English very quickly and very quickly understood the industrial system. Uh, he was coming from an agricultural area, like all of the immigrants. Greece was not an industrialized uh, um, uh, country. And he very quickly understood it and he understood the labor movement and he became a labor organizer. And he then, in many ways, represented the uh, the union. And he was murdered. He was murdered in a very cowardly way. And this history has been uh, forgotten. Uh, and we would like, but but many many people, artists, poets, uh, activists, uh, scholars, um, authors, uh, theater directors, they are trying to keep the memory alive. And we feel it is a responsibility to also explore. Uh, and 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 write about this figure and also the working the working class 
um, Americans, Greek Americans. So we visited them the, the, the cemetery in Trinidad. And we visited the cemetery with the unmarked uh, 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 graves very close to, to Price, Utah, uh, uh, and, uh, below the Castle Gate mine. Uh, the, in the Castle Gate mine, there was, there was an explosion. Uh, hundreds of immigrant workers died, about 125 Greeks, I believe. Some of them, their, their bodies were dis, dis, disconfigured in such a bad de degree they were burned. They could not be identified by their tag. So they were, they were um, uh, then um, unmarked graves. There are the marked graves in the cemetery in Price, but also the unmarked graves. And in Trinidad, and then in Trinidad, we found the, the grave of uh, uh, Luis Ticas. Uh, and then we turn around and we saw a Greek name, and then another Greek name, and then another Greek name. And then we have about 15 to 20 graves with Greek names, men, there was one woman only. And these people, and day of birth, date of birth, date of death, these people were between late teens to early 1930s, all dying in industrial accidents. And back then, the, uh, the companies in the region were not investing in safety practices. So there is another forgotten story of uh, immigrants working, contributing to the industrial growth of the United States and contributing to the economy and dying in the most dire circumstances. And we need to remember, we believe this experience. By the way, also we saw the grave of a immigrant woman, young, the, the women were dying, most likely they died in childbirth. There were, back then, many women died in childbirth. So this is then another forgotten story that needs to be told. Okay, because getting very late, I will very quickly take the questions from Gerasimos Katsan and then we will close. Uh, Gerasimos says, uh, this question refers to the Omaha riots, Moscow's quote. I don't understand the question, but I don't know if you do. Um, the Omaha, the South Omaha riot. Okay. Uh, the South Omaha riot. Uh, do you do you need more specific information of what happened? What is what is the question about? I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. I just read what uh, Gerasimus wrote here. W would you so please? Let's leave it. Then I will go to his other two questions. And then it will close. Okay. The other two questions he had at the beginning was, was there a commensurate anti-Orthodox notion along with the anti-Catholic on the part of the Protestant, Protestant majority? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, that, that's a that's an that's a very very important question, uh, which will help us to understand why the Ahepa early on the Ahepa took a distance from the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, it is very interesting if you if you if you start research uh, on early twentieth century Greek Orthodoxy, many times you will find entries that refer to the Greek Orthodox people, but they are referred as Catholics. So many people were confusing. They didn't know what Greek Orthodoxy was. They had no idea. And they would confuse them with Catholics. So they would classify them under Catholics. So it is then, and because the anti-Catholicism of the era was rampant, this is one of the reasons that explicitly we have documents that the early founders of Ahepa made a case, to, as I mentioned, to distance themselves from the Greek Orthodox Church. And that was, that was another dramatic shift uh, from the traditionalist way, with, which will equate Greek identity with Orthodox, Orthodox identity. Uh, and, uh, and a scholar whom I admire very, very much, Yanis Papadopoulos, he quotes the traditionalist way 
the traditionalist claim about identity, I will say it in Greek, pan Elinas prepi naine orthodox. Orthodox. <laughs> uh, every, every Greek must be an orthodox. And a HEPA spokespeople. And it will be interesting also to, and going back to, to Gerasimus's question about the average American, it will be also interesting to identify who were the Achepa leaders? Uh, what kind of group were they? Uh, and th that's an interesting story. And we do have, we do have some of their bi uh, biographies, but nevertheless, we do have spokesperson of Achepa. By the way, Achepa was not a uniform group. They, they were the hyper assimilationists, Vasily Tsembidis and Dean Alfange were the against the Greek language, against any connection with Greek Orthodoxy, and Buras and Vuras were for the Greek Orthodox connection and the language in maintenance. But nevertheless, we do have then an early statement of the assimilation is that we say many of our brothers, Hellenic brothers, belong to different denominations. We don't, there are many Greeks who are not Greek Orthodox. And we must include them. So here then we have a Christian ecumenical, right? A Christian ecumenical position, in other words, and that is reflected in the honorary membership that Achepa was um, extending to white Americans. The criterion was that they were Christian, not Greek Orthodox. So we do have then um, a situation where Achepa is distancing itself from Greek Orthodoxy for a number of reasons. Again, we need to look at the archives to have the full picture, but certainly to decisively uh, 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 protect themselves from association with Catholicism. Now, the Achepa uh, changed. Achepa changed. Uh, again, identity changes because of the circumstances change. And we do have in 1931, for example, the uh, Athenagoras, um, the archbishop is um, uh, present in the Achepa convention. So Achepa then at some point reconnects or connects rather with Greek Orthodoxy, a connection that you know is, is continuing and is taking an interesting form um, lately. So this is the, the answer I can offer as a kind of an outline of a complex issue. Okay, and the last question again from Gerasimus. Parenthetically, you note forty thousand dollars compensation. Right. Could you explain that? Right. What right. compensated and who paid? I see. Okay, thank you. Yes. Well, the the Greek the the okay. So there was a total destruction of Greek properties, Greek immigrant properties in um in South Omaha. And it was the Greek government which initiated the compensation process uh, through dip diplomatic routes, right? The Greek government for a number of reasons, and this is another chapter about that era, which is very interesting, the role of the Greek government vis-a-vis -vis the Greek immigrants. And the relationship is very complex. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting story. I don't have time and it's getting late, as you mentioned, to elaborate on it. But the, the immigrants claimed a compensation of about $300,000 uh, due to the activism of the Greek government, they got only 40,000, which if we translate this 40,000 in 2000 value money, because Moscow wrote it in 2000, is about $600,000. Uh, today's today's money value today's value, so this is then the, the the situation. It is the Greek government acting on behalf of the interests of the immigrants, pressing the American government for compensation, not getting what they requested, but getting something, and uh, the immigrants are shortchanged. Very good. Thank you very much. With this, we close the lecture. Thank you.